Hello and welcome to this webinar, the subject of storytelling for library advocacy at the time of COVID-19. Thank you very much for your time for joining us and I hope that we, you will find this a useful opportunity to learn a little bit both about what IFLA is doing and what you can do, but some of the reasons why we think it's important to invest effort in storytelling right now. First of all, a little bit of housekeeping. First of all, we are looking to offer interpretation services for this meeting. The instructions are up on the screen. So alternatively, firstly, at the bottom of the screen, you can click on, on live or more. Then from the list of options that turn up, turns up, select view stream on custom live streaming service. This should open up a new browser window with text in it. You can choose the language into which the text is translated by clicking on the settings button that looks like a small cog or wheel and the list of languages you can use is up on the screen. Then simply arrange the windows so that you can see the webinar and the text at the same time. Alternatively, you can follow on another device by going to attend.wordly.ai and entering the session ID, all big letters, T-R-Y-S hyphen seven, six, four, three, and then your name. And then on this other device, a tablet, a phone, whatever else you have, you should see the text of the meeting. In addition, a couple of, a couple of uh, notes around privacy. We are recording this event and we'll make it available subsequently. We will also be recording the chat. However, we will not be publishing this and only using it to follow up if necessary. The, we will therefore be deleting the chat after some point. Given that this is a webinar, your names will not appear on the screen at any point. In addition, because this is a webinar, we have muted microphones and turned cameras off for this event. However, of course, we do welcome interaction and your comments and questions. So please feel free to use the chat function. And if you have a question, to use the Q&A button at the bottom. If you look at this, not only can you include your own questions, but also you can vote for questions by other people. This will be good because it means that then we can identify the questions that interest you most and that we should prioritize for answers. If you do have technical questions, please don't hesitate to ask us in the chat and someone will get back to you. So we only have an hour for this webinar and we have a lot of content to cover. As you are probably aware, IFLA has been working to promote storytelling for some time. I hope that as many of you as possible have already visited our SDG stories page on our library map of the world, which has so many and an increasing number now of great stories about what life is doing to deliver development. However, we felt that now was a good moment to renew this focus, partly because of all the great examples out there of libraries showing resilience, resourcefulness, inventiveness, in finding ways to provide great services to people despite the circumstances. But we're also seeing a number of examples emerging of libraries, library associations, institutions deliberately looking to gather and present stories as part of their work, partly to show what they're doing now, to build morale, to share ideas, but also with advocacy in mind. And we're keen to share some of these lessons. Therefore, this webinar will have three parts. The first, we'll talk about why storytelling matters so much now during COVID-19. Then we'll start looking through some of the examples and the different ways in which these can be presented. And finally, we'll look to give you some really good practical advice on how to go about gathering the evidence to tell your story. So to introduce myself quickly, I'm Stephen Weiber, Manager for Policy and Advocacy at IFLA. A large part of my job on advocacy is to convince people that libraries are worth acting for. It's, we're very aware that there's a lot of sympathy for libraries out there, but a lot of the time people take them for granted. They're happy that they're there, but they don't realize what it is that they can do, that they need to do to support our institutions. As part of advocacy, we use a number of tools, but storytelling is a crucial one. And I will set out some of the examples later, because storytelling can be such a great way of grabbing the attention of getting people to focus, to identify, to feel empathy for libraries and library users and really mobilize themselves to actually mobilize themselves to act. These sorts of lessons, these sorts of stories can be applied, can be useful in so many cases from the UN level 
where we're trying to talk about the importance of libraries in delivering the sustainable development goals to our work at the World Intellectual Property Organization, where we're trying to show how copyright reform can make a real difference on the ground for people. In all of these situations, great storytelling is something really important. And this is why this is the question, the subject that really matters. Why do we tell stories? Now, as said, advocacy is about convincing people. And that's all about how do you switch onto people's brains? How do you actually make sure that they listen to you, that they hear you, that they understand you, and that they change their minds? Now, as such, there's a big dose of psychology in here. Understanding a little about how brains work is important in order to help you be as effective as possible. A key starting point here is that the human brain has two parts or systems. This is an idea that applied to economics has won Nobel Prizes. First of all, there's an animal part. Um, there's an animal part which works on instinct. And secondly, a more logical, computer-like part, which takes the time necessary to make rational choices. The animal part tends to move more quickly as it takes less energy to take an instinctive decision rather than consider all the options. Now, this leads to three issues in the way we think about things. Firstly, there's what we call a prominence effect. When we're trying to take a decision, something we want to do is we want to feel comfortable. We want to feel that what we're looking at, it, what, that what we're looking at is familiar, that it's known. And so what's important is to make sure that when you're asking someone to take a decision, they feel like they do know the people, the situation that's involved, that they can imagine it in their heads, that they can feel a relation to, to it. This can be even more important, even more effective sometimes than statistics. It's also because single stories can often be more powerful than many. Often people will feel a sense of ineffectiveness that they can't necessarily do anything when they're faced with big numbers, with big statistics. How can I, as an individual, do something about a really big problem involving thousands, millions of people, or dollars, year, dollars, euros, or whatever, euros, or whatever? I can only do something that's close to me. I can only make a difference in this, uh, as a small scale. So you've got to make people think about that small scale where they can have a real effect that they can understand. Indeed, large numbers can lead to something that's called psychic numbing especially when we're talking about something negative, the brain just no longer wants to have to deal with what's going on. In sum, this means that when we're looking to convince people of the need to support libraries, there's a huge value in bringing stories into the play. While the effect may only be short term until the rational part of the brain starts to kick in, it gives you the possibility to engage. And then once you've got their attention, to expose them to more complicated numbers, bigger data, which may require more effort, but which provides a stronger long-term case for our institutions. Secondly, why do we need stories now? now? Bluntly, it's because we need advocacy now as much as ever. The pandemic has clearly been a huge human tragedy, but this and the measures taken to stop it from being even worse have also had serious impacts on economies, worse than the 2008 crisis for many countries that were affected. Now this matters for libraries, both those relying directly on government funding and those whose budgets depend on related factors such as local business rates or people willing and able to pay to go to university or others. As we can see from this forecast from the OECD, we've seen a really spectacular drop in economic output. Now, what seems certain within the recovery from the pandemic is that even as economies return to pre-pandemic levels, they will do so with a hangover. With fewer people working and more people relying on benefits, pressure on government spending will be higher. Where governments have borrowed money, they will have to be making paying higher interest rates or trying to pay the money back. This is clearly a worry for those libraries that benefit from public spending. What we need to do, therefore, is make the argument to make people understand that libraries can be part of the solution, that we can help people get back to work, that we can close the education gap, that we can help stop people dropping out of society, that we can drive innovation and resilience, that without libraries, the recovery will be slower, less equal, that we will miss the opportunity to build back better. You will, of course, know best where you can tell your story, and you'll hear later from Christina about the potential to feature your work on the library map of the world. Of course, many countries also have their own databases of stories, for example, that they can use 
to make the work of libraries real to decision makers and those who influence them. Examples that can be used in conversation, in news stories, in blogs, in publications. So to finish off my part, what story to tell? Now, I like this image because it illustrates one of the key points made earlier. It's not just focusing on the numbers, but it's bringing out practical, real examples. They have also, and I think this is a great choice, made it personal by showing how the continued closure of libraries in Sydney has affected one particular girl, Sophie, who's in the screen or in the picture. They could have found a picture of a closed door or even a stock photo of a library, but this is a really powerful personal touch. It also highlights one of the key subjects of stories, which I'll cover next. Of course, a first key area of focus is libraries as partners for development. How can you tell a story that shows that libraries are delivering on the priorities of society? Our storytelling manual, which Christina will present, offers a great entry point here, setting out how you can use the sustainable development goals to focus your ideas. You will be the best judges, of course, of what are the priorities that matter most for your communities and their politicians in the recovery from the pandemic. A second area of focus can be on how libraries respond to crises. It's been clear to everyone how important it is to be adaptable, to be resilient, to be inventive. It's also a key argument for decision makers who want to know that, even if things get worse again, they can count on libraries to find ways to serve communities safely. Finally, and linked to the previous slide, there is the value of telling stories about what people have missed. Now, I encourage you to look at the article on our website about what the Australian Library and Information Association and the Library Association of North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany have done, as these provide useful ways of showing to decision makers what the costs will be if they do decide to close. Effectively, who would want to make Sophie sad? In summary then, we know that stories can help make things real for people, increase their likelihood of taking favourable decisions, and get around the natural human interest tendency to lose interest when talking about large numbers. As such, they're a key part of our advocacy. We know the need for this advocacy is stronger than ever, with difficult economic times ahead. And we know that stories can focus not only broadly on how our institutions contribute to development, but also on how they've shown resilience and what would happen if they're closed again. To get into more depth on the sorts of stories we can see emerging, I'm very happy now to hand over to the Svina. Svina. You're muted, Despina. Hello, everybody. Um, let me share my screen too. So welcome to our session from my side as well. It's really, it's really great to, to, it's really exciting to have a webinar on storytelling. And it's really exciting to, to share with you all those um, um, examples that we have seen happening around the world. Before I continue, I want to tell you that you are free to um, pose your questions at the chat and uh, we will have some time to answer them at the end. And um, uh, if we, the time runs, we run out of time, then we'll, uh, we'll try to figure out another way to send you answers to any questions you might have. Um, so, um, yeah, it's really exciting to see how libraries have been reacting to the COVID-19 crisis around the world, and specifically in terms of the storytelling, uh, from a story storytelling perspective. So I'll use the next 15 minutes to um, um, share my observations with you. Um, so there have been dozens of storytelling uh, practices from libraries, library associations, or, or library-related organizations. Um, and um, there are even some patterns that um, have come to the surface. So during the next uh, few minutes, I will um, unfold um, uh, each pattern. I will describe the, um, 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 each pattern on a theoretical level, and I'll give you also some examples under each pattern so that you get some ideas in order to implement them in your library, or if you have already implemented them, um, to you know to, to get a step further. So um, um, I would like to stress uh, before I start with the patterns that storytelling is uh, related to meaning making, to relevance, interpretation, um, participation, interaction, and experience. It gains it gains attention and it engages the audience 
uh, because it evokes feelings, memories, and curiosity. So storytelling is a really powerful tool. As stories, fiction or nonfiction, seem to influence our attitudes, hopes, and values more than any other document, more than any academic writing piece, uh, government laws or, or um, rules, and so on. So it's really used today in so many varied activities uh, from, from you know, organizational um, um, courses, management courses, uh, to self-expression and communication with excluded community groups. Um, so really, there is, there is a vast area of application that this storytelling can have. So let's have first a look um, at the um, uh, patterns. So there is a website on IFLA, so you may all go and visit it um, after our webinar. There, this is a really wealthy archive that we are we have been keeping a track of what is happening around the world, and it's a dynamic uh, um, web, web page. So we have seen those patterns, six patterns, digital storytelling, social media, non-linear, outside the library walls, storytelling among librarians, and non-neutral. So let's dive into each one. So the new IFLA strategy, you may, uh, all of you or some of you know, the 2019-2024, um, which is quite uh, more relevant actually, forward thinking and needed than ever before, um, speaks about technology in its strategic direction. So um, according to the Key Initiative 2.3, you know, it's, it's mentioned keep up with and adopt new technologies and uh, the key initiative 3.2 says support virtual networking and connections. So the IFLA strategy was launched in 2019, but just a few months after, after its launch in, in spring 2020, the COVID-19 outbreak happened and all those strategic directions were suddenly forced into implementation in an accelerated speed due to the crisis. So the first thing someone could think of when we talk about storytelling in the post-COVID era is for sure a digital storytelling, as digital has become and will become even more and more common. So what do, we, what, what do we refer to when we talk about digital storytelling? Digital storytelling is the, as storytelling is, the heart, is in the heart of communication and the other way around, communication is in the heart of storytelling. Um, how do librarians um, tell the story of their library? Do they need to have storytelling skills when communicating, for example, their Facebook Live art classes or you know, when you offer online cooking courses, how do you tell this story? How do you tell the story of, that your library has been transformed into a temporary homeless uh, shelter or into a shoeing factory for masks or that um, it's a food bank distribution hub or it's a pandemic par parenting place for, for the children of the uh, first, uh, um, um, first row um, um, staff? So, um, for example, in, New in Auckland, in New Zealand, uh, librarians, you know, uh, used to make calls, and they do actually, they continue to do that, they make calls to check on the well-being of the vulnerable um, older people. How do you communicate all those newly services? Um, one thing is for sure that um, all those need uh, storytelling skills. So let's see some applications on digital storytelling. Here I'll focus the examples on digital story times. There have been hundreds of libraries that have started applying this since the COVID outbreak, and it's something that many libraries did not used to do that before. Um, so, for example, a librarian in Serbia started on the 19th of March and did 45 Facebook Lives. So every evening at 6 p.m., she read stories online, she recommended books and authors, and gave advice to parents. So every evening, she tried to be an interesting storyteller for half an hour. So another great example is the multilingual digital storytelling. We have seen that in many places. For example, in Liverpool, they do the multilingual in like in English and Hindi, or in Australia at the Monash Public Library, they started with one language, then they went to bilingual, then trilingual, and then they went to um, four languages story time. So um, sharing multiple languages side by side by, with storytelling is an incredibly special initiative linked with embracing the local diversity. In Mexico, they organized virtual readings, having different people reading in one Zoom call, involving stories related to the SDGs for children. So really a unique way to attract people's attention to the library values that are interlinked with the societal ones. Here you see this is the Chicago Public Library that even featured the Obamas reading a story on a Facebook Live event. So during the lockdown period, digital storytelling became very famous. Um, and um, although it's the first thing that someone would think of, it doesn't mean it's the easiest thing to implement. 
there are several barriers you're all familiar with if you work in the sector. Um, I'm referring not only to copyright restrictions, but also to the fact that we have been seeing unprecedented times of increased reliance on digital connectivity. So on the one hand, copyright laws are often firmly stuck in the analog age. On the other hand, many library users have serious problems with connectivity and the impact of the digital divide is as clear as ever. So we need really to be empathetic here and not to create another excluded or underrepresented group due to the connectivity issues. Social media, so important nowadays, but so unpredictable too. So digital stories are currently created in nearly every digital device and they're experienced by almost everyone. The social media world though is constantly changing and one size does not fit all. You really have to think which platform you have to use for whatever service you want to create. Here, this is an example from the Biblioteca Alexandrina. They do Facebook and YouTube storytelling through their, through their TV studio. They also offer remote reading services for the blind by providing a group of volunteers to help the visually impaired patrons in reading and researching, a service that is offered all over Egypt. And uh, also the, their YouTube channel is um, streaming all their cultural and artistic activities that take place during this time. Uh, and also live tours at the different museums at the Biblioteca Alexandrina. I want to also mention here that um, this is, might be an opportunity for libraries um, to get funded because we have seen many recovery emergency funds focusing on uh, the digital devices, methods and practices. So you may want to really consider having a serious strategic focus on your library's digital presence from now and on. For example, in the USA, there has been the two, two trillion coronavirus aid, relief and economic security act, which includes 50 million um, to the IMLS, to the Institute of Museum and Library Services, to focus only on digital inclusion projects. Storytelling, that's the third pattern. So storytelling is never a one-way process. Storytelling and communication both relate to the articulation of understandings. So those are non-linear. It's always a two-way process. We all know that we have passed from object-oriented to human-centered approaches in library and museum practices. We've turned the focus from it being on books to, to it being on people. But here now we're talking um, the, from the, about the process, about the direction from people to people. So many libraries have given users not just the physical space, but also the intellectual space to let them challenge services, practices, ideas, and products. So I would really ask you to consider, if you have not done it already, um, unlocking your community's stories and make your users, your users co-creators. As libraries become more and more community centers, the role of the librarian has been broadened so much. A librarian is not the person who puts the books on the shelf, is a curator, is a communicator, is an expert in customer patron service, is a 3D printer expert, and so many more. Here I want to bring you a few examples where community groups have been viewed as co-curators, shaping so storytelling and influencing exhibition outcomes. So here you see the example from Australia is the collective isolation project Memory Bank from the State Library in Victoria. Their aim is to archive what everyday life is in Victoria, uh, has been during the lockdown and this collective isolation. Another example is this one in the USA from the King's Kingsport Public Library. They launched this initiative to collect their community members' coronavirus stories to document how the pandemic affected their community's life. There have been many similar initiatives around the world um, and various examples of curating collections focused on issues of interest, like for example, anxiety and stress, disease, recovery, trauma, and so on. So here you just see um, a few more examples. The fourth um, uh, pattern is the outside the library walls. The outside the walls is a common, um, uh, common method, we all know, but now here it seems that it has found its way through the technology. Only with the difference that this goes to the privileged ones once again, to people who have access to technology, to the internet and to machines, laptops, computers, uh, phones, uh, smartphones. But mentioning this in terms of storytelling, we saw stories from the library to communities that said, said things like this, like if you cannot come to us, we will come to you through technology. So, or visit the library in another, in a different way. And we saw the movements, you know, library from home or library at home rising, again, in a more accelerated speed than we would ever have imagined. And for those services, some libraries even at that hard time 
have the will to go to the community and ask them which services do they miss most. This is um, what they did in the Arapoa Public Libraries. They launched an online survey to determine which services the public misses most. And this helped them inform the library at home services, but also their reopening plans and strategies. Um, and then, you know, there are libraries that they developed even, you see here, and, and um, uh, you see here that they even developed, you know, new, whole new sections on their websites. And um, we here really need to think about this digital divide. We don't want to make it bigger. We have to think strategically where to focus in the future in order not to repeat the same mistakes and have again excluded groups. Some solutions to these problems are here. You can see them here. Um, on the left side, you see um, uh, a banner on, um, on, from the Shanghai Library uh, that they took a more digital approach and jointly created a special digital collection available on the screens at the temporary hospitals in Wuhan and also on patients' devices. And on the right side, you see the, um, an eight, eight feet banner from the Washington Anytime Library. Uh, they created a banner where they, they hang outside the library fence to let passengers, uh, passers by know that the digital library is always open and it's always at their disposals, disposal and that they can uh, access the Wi-Fi from there. So all the above are related to the external narrative. So what is discussed with, from us, from the libraries, uh, you know, with the community. But what about the internal communication with the, the professional community? Among the, among the library staff or with colleagues in a nearby city or in another country? When and how do we exchange our stories? So storytelling has been used in the cultural sector for organizational development. And uh, you know, you can you know, people um, people's libraries started to open for the first time closed Facebook groups or um, you know maybe even Facebook accounts to exchange successes or failures, and this has been enhanced with COVID. And you know, uh, a moment of your everyday life in the library or people from the archive sharing with people um, you know from the front at the front desk and so on. So here are a few examples: the Lianza, the Library Information Association in New Zealand. Um, they um, um, did uh, this um, daily drop-in Zoom calls for librarians to discuss things. And then in the, in the Bibliotheca Alexandrina, they did a YouTube series of uh, quarantine diary of information professionals. And um, then the next pattern is a non-neutral one. All the above is about the how, but what, uh, what about the what we share? What do we talk about when we talk about library storytelling? Many uh, see libraries as the places for recovery from traumas and focus already on mindfulness and uh, psychology and um, not only leisure time entertainment practices. On the one hand, you document also your archive, you show to the future generations what is happening. On the other hand, you speak about things and you stand up and take a position. Even when you decide to collect and present and how to present the COVID-19 crisis, this is a position itself. There is a movement, you know, denying the existence of COVID-19. Also, how do you deal with fake news? For example, on the left side, a library in the USA hosts an online class on misinformation in times of COVID-19. And what does the science of other libraries mean? How is it interpreted by the community? Um, the same also with the ALA, that they made uh, openly uh, to the, open to the public a book about disaster planning. We know we're, we have to be better in that. These are difficult things that uh, we are difficult to talk about. Um, and so what libraries communicate when they're telling a story is also the intention of communicating it. And uh, virtually any piece, any sign, any object tells a story. Sometimes this includes uh, humor too, and this is what happened in Yara public libraries. Um, and humor is also important in storytelling. Um, and also want to say here that the failure to tell a story is also a story in its own right. So the lack of awareness towards stories is reflected in the way libraries generally prioritize their communication development. And this can happen when they remain totally silent and when they don't meet the needs of their society, when they don't have social impact. So libraries, to, to sum up, can act as centers of cultural understandings and thus people have the opportunity to communicate across borders um, and no matter their sexuality, religion, skin color, political views or anything else. Libraries then become the arenas for discussions and debates and then they become necessary in the society. I would like to end my part by sharing an example from an IFLA unit, uh, the IFLA Library Services to Multicultural Population Sections newsletter. Uh, you will all find this issue in this link that is uh, you see on the left, on the right um, uh, picture. 
And this uh, newsletter has uh, fo focuses on stories of how libraries around the world have continued to work with multicultural communities through the current COVID-19 pandemic. And like this um, IFLA featured uh, COVID related story, let's say, uh, we, I want to also end uh, here by saying that we are very open to feature uh, your stories on, IFLA, on, the, on IFLA's websites. Uh, one way is the IFLA from home, and um, you also see here how you can get, um, how you can receive the stories of the IFLA from home. You just follow the IFLA L mailing list or you follow IFLA on social media. You may find all stories so far with the hashtag IFLA from home. And, um, and also another very good way is the library map of the world, which my colleague Christina is now going to talk about. So thank you so much and I pass the floor to Christina. Hello everyone. I hope you hear me well and um, let me try and share my screen as well. So now you should be able to see it. Uh, so my name is Christina. I'm uh, IFLAS member engagement officer and uh, at IPLA, I'm taking care of the library map of the world, which was already mentioned uh, several times uh, by Stephen and Destina. And thank you for that uh, very good overview of, uh, of the story, different types of storytelling. So, but in my part uh, of the presentation, I will focus uh, on a specific type of storytelling, let's say, uh, and we'll talk about uh, stories that we have uh, on the library map of the world. If you haven't visited the site, uh, here you can see the URL uh, and you can go online and check uh, what we already have. Uh, these are more than 40 stories now coming uh, from around the world. And uh, these are all stories which are related to sustainable development goals. So when we will work uh, on storytelling, uh, we will look into how, how these library programs and projects that you do in your libraries now in COVID times also relate to the SDGs. And if you are not familiar uh, with the Sustainable Development Goals and the United Nations 2030 Agenda, uh, I just want to recommend that there is a one-page uh, uh, infographic uh, that will help you quickly understand what we talk about. It's called Information for Development, Why Access Matters Across the SDGs, uh, which uh, lists the, mo the most commonly used uh, relevant SDGs uh, in our uh, library uh, stories, uh, and building out uh, the key things like access to information, development of skills uh, or literacies, uh, making uh, sure the cultural heritage uh, is sa safeguarded and things like that will help you to dig into that. But when it comes to the library map of the world, uh, we have uh, requirements for those stories. And uh, in the rest of the 10 or 15 minutes, I will talk about those requirements uh, to make sure that, uh, that you know what these are and how to prepare in advance. It's because now, as was already mentioned, you are turning your library programs all around to try to adapt them to the, to the new context uh, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and there are ways how you can make sure that uh, if the time comes and you want to put your story on the library map of the world, that you have everything that you need. And when it comes to the stories on the map, uh, as you will also see from those examples, uh, that uh, we need to tell uh, about three things. And first of all, it is, uh, is to tell about our community, uh, about our people, uh, for who the program or the activity is uh, developed, uh, what are the challenges, uh, so that we understand the context uh, and the problem, problem and how the library is helping. So the next, uh, uh, we want to talk about what we did or what we do for our community and that's to talk about uh, your project or your program. And finally, uh, the most important part of those SDG stories is to talk about impact. 
because uh, the target for those SDG stories on the library map of the world are not uh, us, other librarians, but the audience to whom we talk through the map uh, is our decision makers and our stakeholders. And we want to make sure that we demonstrate what the contribution is and how uh, libraries are helping to, uh, to solve uh, the, the challenges that we have in our communities and uh, in our countries. And then in the bottom you see something, uh, the three boxes containing something related to data is because we say that the stories on the map uh, are all evidence-based and we want to make sure that we have evidence in each of those parts. And the rest of the presentation, I will just walk you through each of those and will explain uh, what that means. So first of all, uh, when we uh, talk about the context, uh, we want to be able to describe where the activity is taking place and what's the actual situation, right? Uh, we kind of want to draw uh, the picture of what is happening uh, in, in our community, in our town, or in our village, in our city, uh, and to understand what, what is the issue, and to understand why we select uh, a particular target group, uh, would it be, for example, children, or, or elderly people, or, 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 or women, or other group, uh, by describing that uh, context, uh, so we want to understand that. Uh, and it's to talk about the community and the community needs. And uh, this list, when it comes to stories, uh, like when it comes to programs uh, which are developed specifically during the pandemic times, it's not that you need to extensively describe every single aspect, like for, for example, giving the community demographics, but also describing geography. But if that is relevant uh, to what you are doing to understand the problem, then, then we want to make sure that uh, that that is described. So where can you get uh, that data when it comes? And there are many other, many sources where you can look, look for, but the main idea here is that uh, now you are doing a program which is particularly important uh, during the time, time of uh, pandemic and time of crisis. And uh, maybe in a year or so, when we hope that it will be over, uh, and you will want to tell your story to a broader audience and put the story on the map uh, so uh, that you will need to find the sources of what was the context. That's why the recommendation that I have here is because the governments are reporting frequently uh, in media, uh, in, in government websites about the situations that are happening uh, in each of our countries. So the, the recommendation here would be just to keep track uh, of those sources uh, and uh, make, a, let's say, sort of the documentation or a diary of what is happening uh, in your, your community. You will find a lot of information in newspapers, uh, many NGOs uh, or other community organizations might also uh, document uh, the, the, what is happening in the community. And this is something that that uh, we will want to be, have included in, in the story. So the next part then, uh, and it's easy, the easiest probably part because uh, uh, we all are great at telling what we do. So is to describe well uh, what, uh, what has been done and uh, how much and what the scope of it, uh, who was involved and what partnerships we, we developed during the program. And at the end, uh, who is uh, the target group and how many people participated and et cetera, et cetera. But the challenge here when we think about pandemic times is that you may arrive at the situation when the, the standard uh, collection of, of statistics about uh, number of users coming to library, for example, or number of loan, loans and other things, uh, you might want to reconsider that and find the innovative ways of how to make sure that you track uh, and make records of, uh, of the community that you serve. And um, here, for example, I also want to share a couple of examples. So we work uh, on a story from 
from Vallapattanam li Library in, in India, in, in Kerala State, uh, who, who changed uh, their summer program. Basically, in a couple of days when the pandemic started, they were planning to, have, to work with children and have a summer camp where everybody comes together and do creative activities uh, to learn about the sustainable development. So they actually used uh, the WhatsApp uh, solution for, for connecting those uh, children into groups uh, and, uh, and gave assignments uh, to, uh, in these groups to, to the children uh, around uh, certain topics and the groups were moderated. So when it comes to, to collecting the statistics, so then it is different type of library user or the activity attendant. So the number of uh, children connected in the WhatsApp group, for example, or the number of moderators uh, engaged in different activities or number of um, stories told in those WhatsApp groups. So these are kind of the statistics that uh, are meaningful to then then track uh, during the program. So and the third thing uh, I want to focus a little bit uh, more is, uh, is outcomes data. And, uh, and what do you do in, 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 type, in time of a pandemic when you cannot uh, do a regular, uh, let's say, uh, impact evaluation survey? You cannot uh, hand out a feedback uh, questionnaire in your, in your library after the event or, or things like that. So here, uh, what we need for the story is we need to know what uh, effect your program had on your target group. So how the life of people uh, involved in your program has changed. Uh, did you provide any knowledge or, or how did their skills uh, improved or they started to do things differently or they were only able to do things because of, of the library program? And here, for example, a good uh, example is also a story we work currently from Bhutan, uh, where the, the read centers and the, by using the community library network, uh, they work together with teachers. And what they did, they actually delivered uh, the school books uh, to the doorsteps uh, of children. So it's also something to think about. So how, how do you, what do you, how do you evaluate uh, those sort of things uh, when you don't have the technology? So when it comes to collecting that evidence, uh, just a couple of ideas that I want to share is that instead of uh, doing a questionnaire, you can do a poll, for example, in your Facebook group and ask for a feedback uh, from your users, or you can use uh, the same WhatsApp group uh, to ask uh, for, for feedback in, in the form of audio message, for example, and, and collect user stories and, uh, and their testimonials about uh, how library was helping uh, by using this way. You can set up uh, a simple Google form or by using other solution and, and collect the feedback uh, in that way. So, and one last thing that I want to mention also is that each story on the map, as you will see, has uh, visuals. Uh, and collecting photos and videos uh, might, uh, might be something that, uh, that is not so easy uh, during the time of pandemic when you cannot invite uh, people to your library uh, and take pictures uh, yourself. Uh, you might be considering uh, asking also your users to take pictures for you uh, and document uh, your activities uh, in that way. So these were the three uh, uh, three requirements to or or parts uh, that we are looking forward to have uh, described in each of the stories is to tell about uh, what you did, so why you did it, uh, and what is the impact. And uh, here, the last thing I want to also mention that uh, if you, that that we are the library map of the world team is also providing uh, a support. If you have ideas uh, about the programs that you are doing now and are thinking about the ways how you might want to uh, evaluate uh, uh, the impact of your program, so you can just uh, email us and then we can talk about it and, and find uh, an innovative way of how 
how to do that uh, impact evaluation in a simple way that is not a lot of effort neither for you or nor for uh, your, uh, your community. So, as uh, Stephen already mentioned in the beginning, uh, I will just uh, mention it again. So, we have uh, a storytelling manual uh, available uh, in uh, several languages. You can download it from uh, IFLAS website. And the manual has uh, several chapters. It, in the beginning, it will explain more about uh, the sustainable development goals or the SDGs themselves. Uh, by giving more examples from other libraries and library programs. And the most important chapter here is then called uh, How to Tell Your Story, uh, which will in more depth describe those three parts that I just went through. But also it will give you a chapter on how to prepare your pictures, how to take care that the copyright uh, is uh, cleared uh, for all the visuals that you will want to attach to the story. And at the end, how to get the the, uh, the story into the map and what it means. Uh, so I invite you to download and uh, explore more. But for those who has less time and uh, as many of us <laughs> are in this uh, category, so we actually turn the story, the most important part of the manual into one page uh, infographic called storytelling flowchart. Uh, and if you go through this by trying to answer those questions, you will also be able to understand if your story is, uh, first of all, for the map, or maybe it is something that uh, we can highlight in different uh, other uh, platforms, like, for example, in, in IFLA from Home series, as the, but which Despino just mentioned. And then if you have uh, all the information for the story, uh, that is required uh, on the map. So, and here I'll finish uh, uh, my part of the presentation today. And I uh, will invite you, I want to invite you to really write to us uh, at email a library map at itpla.org. Uh, to share your ideas, to share, share what you do in your libraries. And I was very happy to see in the poll, uh, in the beginning of this webinar that uh, we have uh, almost all library types represented here and, and something that we are now also looking forward to learn more, especially from national libraries, because we learned that in many countries, uh, when it comes to opening up uh, uh, different resources uh, developed by national libraries has helped uh, a lot in, when it comes to education during the pandemic and, and things like that. So uh, please uh, contact us and uh, we'll be happy to work together and uh, maybe get your story uh, on the map. And here I'll hand uh, back to Stephen. I think it's just about the time to look into questions. Great, so thank you, Christina, and, and we'll leave this slide up there. So um, a couple of people have already put up a question. So we have a question from Andres and from Svetlana. Um, we encourage everyone else to add your questions in now um, and either if if we have time now we'll answer them if we don't we will include answers when we post the recording of this webinar online and um, I wanted both of the questions are to all of the panelists so I wanted to open up and ask if either Vespina or Christina have responses on, on Andres's or Svetlana's questions just to read them out quickly so Andres's first is in the context of a pandemic, where do you think we should focus our advocacy energies? In users, in our bosses, or in politicians? Svetlana's is how the pandemic has changed our understanding of basic values, whether we agree with the concept of new ethics, and how these new norms are being incorporated into the activities of libraries. So I don't know if Vespina, Christina, you have thoughts? Yeah, I can start. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, we really like to have a discussion here. Um, and if anyone also wants to speak up, we, we can bring them in with the microphone. Um, so to address, uh, well, it's always, of course, not a one way thing, you know. Uh, it's, I think it's, you mentioned three uh, target groups for your advocacy. I think it's just all included in this triangle, let's say. Um, so. You, you know that you have, you, and you know and you do it, I know you do it, that you make space uh, to advocate to all of them. 
Um, but I would uh, like to stress that I think a bit more uh, focus should be on the users, uh, but certainly not forget the rest because advocacy is also to, to the politicians and to your bosses. But first and foremost <coughs> are the users and um, the, to cover their needs, which are actually so much changing right now. Um, so for public libraries, it's, you know, as I said, uh, I think we need to focus on recovery and trauma and, you know, so libraries can become places so for recovery. Um, and then, you know, you can, this way you, you will show to your politicians and to your bosses how important the library is and how necessary library, libraries are. Um, so if users speak about them and if they cannot live without libraries, then you have achieved your goal. Um, yeah, that's from my side. I don't want to, um, I don't know if anyone else wants to add something. Christina, did you have any thoughts? Yeah, before Stephen, you go into in-depth of this <laughs> question. I, for me, it's more about uh, how to bring the, the same message to all the three target groups when it comes to advocacy, because, well, you will work with your users and uh, you can make sure that your users also become your advocates. Uh, and for me, it's more about uh, what are the elements uh, from the point of view of advocacy to bring that same message to your, your stakeholder or the politician uh, would require maybe a little bit more effort than to talk to when you would talk to your bosses. You will you can get more technical. I think is is more about saving time in in giving different message to different audiences, but uh, bringing the same message and and con consistently being on the agenda so that all the the, the, the all, like advocacy audiences would know that the, about what you are doing. So for me, it's more like that. So I, I, I would add, I think I, I agree with, with what both Vespina and Christina have said. I think in particular on Christina's last point, um, having that consistent message so that you're, you are consistent, so that you're saying the same thing, but also thinking a little bit about what people want to hear. What are the stories that set people off? Because to some extent, we're always talking about human beings all of whom have their sort of their, their psychological, you know, the, the, the tendency to respond better to stories than to data if you confront them immediately. Um, so to some extent, and stories work on everyone. Clearly, it's worth thinking about how you present things. And so a, a really good example is how you would promote um, preschool story time activities. Now, if you're presenting that to a parent, what might actually work best is, okay, we're giving you an hour's free time. We're keeping your child entertained and we're doing something good for them for an hour. That will work for a parent. If you're talking to a teacher, you want to talk about school readiness because the contribution of the library means that when the child gets to school, they will find it easier to read, to learn. The teacher will like that more. If you're talking to a politician, you probably need to talk about increasing literacy rates because literacy is vital for the strength of the economy in due course. So often it's a case of using the same arguments and the same stories, but sometimes the language you use varies. I think in terms of how we focus, what I think I'd encourage is that you, you try and map out the ecosystem that we're working in because libraries depend on others for funding like libraries don't charge entry in order to be able to get in so not so much a case of all libraries need to do is keep bringing customers to the door what it's worth thinking about well who influences who um for example it may be very difficult to get to your politician and so exactly being able to um being able to get to the people who influence the politician is important and that can be voters it can be journalists it can be teachers it can be unions so looking trying to understand what is the most immediate effective way of changing opinions and getting support for libraries is important in your own local context and, and you'll know that better and then constructing your strategy in that way clearly as well you need to think long term and short term what can you do in the short term what can you do in the long term and try and prioritize your efforts that way and um, just to respond to Svetlana's comment question quickly and I, I will do that in fewer words than I've just used there and um, I suppose this question of, of, of ethics from what I understand it refers to the idea that everyone has a responsibility to others 
and that it is not a case of just leaving it to government. Everyone should be behaving themselves in order to keep each other safe. But in practical terms, we're already seeing this in libraries where it's becoming the case that people are maybe they have to use the computer for less time or the computers are being reserved to people who don't have access at home or who have a pressing need in order to apply for benefits. Also, behaviour in libraries, keeping a distance, not touching books you're not going to borrow. We're beginning to see that and there are lots of examples on our COVID-19 page. I think more broadly what we'll hopefully see is an understanding that things like internet access should not necessarily should not necessarily just be left to the market that in fact internet access is so vital so that everyone can access education can access library services that there'll be a greater acceptance of saying well this is something where we have to get involved we have a duty to make sure that everyone is connected to to the internet just like they should be connected to water to electricity and then really open up that possibility that everyone can benefit from library services so that, that's my answer to that one. I don't know if Christina Vespina you had additional suggestions and then. Um, yeah I guess uh, you know the new ethics to me uh, rings the bell of new normal. Uh, you know everybody talks about this new normal in library the library sector after Covid and um, um, well it's certainly as I also said in uh, my presentation um, I think it just you know we, we knew we were going there uh, we just didn't know that we would go so fast and so suddenly. So there has been a huge learning curve for library professionals too. Uh, I know these are all new, uh, sudden, and um, also, you know, people, heavy human beings are resistant to change and even so much to sudden change. But um, yeah, I don't know if it's new ethics, and I, I don't know if I, I agree totally with that, but it's certainly new policies, and um, yeah, so, you know, under policies, it's always ethics. So, yeah, so many libraries, we have seen also that many libraries start to change their policies, and actually, I think that this is a good thing, uh, because libraries should go with the society. So, whatever happens, you know, outside the library wall is actually a mirror in the li in the library, inside the library, and how a library acts and communicates. So, um, yeah, that, that was my, I wanted to answer to the planner regarding this and how I see this. And also, uh, last thing to say that the strategy here is so important, you know, mm, that we have to follow the society, societal changes, but uh, in terms of values, which is something like a pillar, you know, so it's, so it's so important to have a strategy in order not to be moved in, in, in terms of our, stra of our values, you know. So that's why we really need to think strategic uh, focus in every library, in every country, in every region and, and globally. So have a look at the IFLA strategy too, because then you're connected to the world. Thank you. And Christina, do you have any words and then we'll close. Yeah, just to reinforce the, what Despina said, because she mentioned what I wanted to say, because for me, I think also the library is the mirror of, of the community. We are in between, of, in, in between of the time of change and the time of discovery. I'm not sure that we can answer that question now, but we can definitely start exploring the meaning of it. Excellent. So th thank you. Uh, thank you, Christina. Thank you, Despina. Thank you to everyone who's joined us today. Um, we will put up uh, the slides and we will put up the recording, potentially with a, a slight edit to make it look less embarrassing at the beginning when I forgot to have the microphone on. Uh, and hopefully we'll do this in the next few days. We'll advertise that through social media so you'll be able to find it up there and hopefully change share it with others. We hope that the web this webinar has been useful and please do use the contact emails that have been suggested, get in touch, share your stories, ask your questions. Thank you very much. Goodbye.